The Scottish journalist Jim Pringle is a legend among foreign correspondents. He covered wars from Nicaragua to Vietnam, Cambodia and the Middle East. He knew the likes of Fidel Castro, Yasser Arafat and Norodom Sihanouk during a career that spanned more than half a century and included major postings with Reuters, Newsweek and The Times in London. I began by asking Pringle to recount the events of the Tet Offensive in 1968 when the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese broke a ceasefire agreement and launched a series of attacks across what was then South Vietnam, which would turn public perception in America against the war in Indochina. I'd had a, a warning uh, that something was going to happen that night by a, a man who later turned out to be uh, a spy a Vietnamese spy. Uh, he he was he worked with the uh, the foreign uh, correspondents there, but at the same time was disappeared every two weeks uh, for two or three days, and that was his reporting to uh, his uh, uh, seniors in the jungle. And that that of course is um, Tham Suan, who was. Uh, Work for Time magazine and for Reuters. Um, what, once the, what did you decide to do once you heard it was going to happen? I mean, what ca what can you do? I, I, I ignored it completely. We had two correspondents up country uh, because the, uh, the, the the offensive had started the night before. So I, I with my uh, colleague Hugh Lunn, an Australian, uh, were taking copy. Uh, deep into the night, and it wasn't until uh, about half past one that uh, I d d drove Hugh Lunn to the home of his girlfriend on the periphery of, the, of, of Saigon, and uh, the, 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 the streets were completely empty when I got back. I parked my car uh, just outside the office on, on the sidewalk and fell asleep, but f at 2 40, I was woken by a series of explosions, and I ran downstairs. I had a a, 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 a man working the uh, telex downstairs, and he uh, and I, I ran past him to the door. The li all the lights were on, and just as I got to the door, I saw f bullets flashing in both ways, uh, just uh, th three or four yards in front of me. Uh, so I, I shouted to him, douse the lights, and uh, uh, we <laughs> we got under a staircase, a wooden staircase, which wouldn't have given us much cover, and I wrote the, the first uh, reports, uh, fighting erupts in the centre of Saigon. I was only about 300 metres from the, the National Palace. Of course, the, the costs there were heavy, as it emerged later on, Tet was uh, a disaster for the Viet Cong, although nobody believed it at the time, but then there was Mini Tet, and there was a tragic circumstances and the deaths of, I think, at least four journalists at Cholon, which you were involved with as well. Well, I, I had been in, involved with, with all these correspondents, I had been the bureau chief, but I had finished my first period in Vietnam, and um, I had been home in Scotland for two weeks. Um, I, it was a Sunday morning, and my, uh, as I remember, my mother came upstairs and she said, there seems to be something on the BBC to the effect that uh, uh, four correspondents have been killed, and and they're men men mentioning two writer correspondents. And I thought, my God, that can't be true. And I rushed downstairs and uh, heard the news. And uh, I did volunteer to go back, but they, they didn't they stop me from doing that. Uh, but I did go back for another 18-month tour, uh, not too long after that. So from Vietnam, uh, where was it next? Lebanon, the Middle East, Yasser Arafat. How did you find Yasser Arafat? I found him a very uh, personable person, and uh, I, I got on well with him. And he always spoke to you as if you were the most important correspondent in the world. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, he, he was a, a good leader for the, the Palestinians. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have leaders like that, and that's why the situation in, in the Middle East is so fraught with, with danger. Is there a way out for the Middle East? And when I ask that too, it's a little bit like, if you look at Vietnam, it's still, it has improved enormously, but it's 
still got issues. When you look at China, it's hardly a free country yet. It wants the world's respect. The world seems to be moving into another era, but we still haven't cleaned up all the issues that came out of the Cold War. Yes, the, uh, the, the Middle East wasn't the Cold War so much, but it was a struggle between the Israelis and the Palestinians, and that struggle was still going on. And the, the, the Israelis are going to build more cities in, in where, where they're on the West Bank, and uh, it's fraught with danger. I'd, I'd like to bring you back to Indochina. Being a correspondent, often your, your life can be divided between countries and regions which often don't have an obvious connection. But I know a lot of these countries were connected in their own way, particularly you know, different alliances, that kind of thing. But Vietnam and China, it's always had an interesting relationship and you were, you were in both. How do you see their relationship today, particularly given what's happening with the South China Sea? Well, both sides are striving to be, uh, seeming to look reasonable about all this, but there is a, a great danger of, of a new war erupting at any time there, especially with uh, Donald Trump in the, the White House. There, there could be trouble in the South China Sea. Uh, the Americans feel that they're, uh, they have a right to, uh, to, to have their uh, ships uh, still uh, patrolling there, and this could come into something serious. I think there's a lot of danger of trouble in the Far East. Uh, a lot of that stems from the situation in North Korea, which uh, I've visited a couple of times. A uh, fascinating place. The Americans are g giving notice that they may do something surprising and uh, dangerous uh, regarding the, the North Vietnamese. Right, now this goes back to your Cambodian connections because you were... Uh You've been married to a Khmer since before the Khmer Rouge. And the Cambodians have always had an interesting relationship with the North Koreans, particularly going back to Norodom Sihanouk, who um, was the king father and the father of independence in this country. You knew them all quite well, and you spent time with them in Pyongyang, and you got to know the North Koreans. What do you think is going through their minds at the moment? That might be... a touch difficult to answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Well, I think our ordinary people pretend that they, they, they're following their, their leaders in North, North Korea, but I, I think many North Koreans are pretty worried. They have, they have inklings what's happening in the South and so on, and uh, they fear that war could hit them again. And the previous war in the 50s was terrible for, for, for the people there, north and south, and they, they fear something like that might happen again. And of course, with your time in Vietnam and Cambodia, the communist world was leaving its mark, particularly with China at the helm, and you managed to spend a good deal of time in Cuba as well. That would have been an extraordinary experience, and... I understand you got to meet, uh, or you interviewed Fidel Castro on several occasions. How how is he, and how how, how do some of these people compare? Um, Fidel Castro, Norodom Sihanouk, or Yasser Arafat. How how do they line up together? They're, they're a kind of a little tribe among themselves. But uh, Castro was a, a, per, a very personable man too, and. The first time I saw him in, 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 in at a diplomatic reception, the place was filled with young Vietnamese girls from the North Vietnam and from the Viet Cong areas of the South, and he was captivated by them. And they each held one of his fingers, <laughs> and, he, and maybe he had you know ten of them at one time <laughs> around them, and he was you know he seemed to like it very much, in a nice sort of way, and. Uh, he, 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 Cuba has and, and Vietnam. It sounds strange, but they've always been gotten on very well. They're, they're the best buddies. And they still are. And they still are. Yes. How, how do you, um, uh, as small, independent communist states, how do you see their relationship with China? As China lived up to expectations over the years or because there was this sort of a, a kind of complete abandonment of these uh, by the Russians and the Chinese after the Cold War and then the, the whole alignment changed again. But how do you see the Chinese in terms of their relationship with these countries? The Chinese are rather bullying with the other states in, in, in the Southeast Asia 
area, uh, and not particularly affects the, the Vietnamese. But the Vietnamese are very reluctant to, to face up to the, the Chinese because they would not get they would get the worst of the the encounter. Uh, but it, it could be very d dangerous you know, just down the road if if, if the Chinese keep, keep on building these uh, fake islands uh, out in the South China Sea. Uh, at some stage, the Vietnamese may uh, s start something themselves, and it's going to be very difficult to finish it. Yeah, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's always very difficult to put it back in. As this country discovered, uh, 30 years of war, uh, which ended 15 years ago, and the changes have been extraordinary. I might just come back to Cambodia. Um, how are your feelings, particularly in regards to the younger generation? There seems to be an enormous difference between the young people of the 21st century versus the older generation here, and uh, it's it's quite stark. Well, the young generation, they don't really understand what happened during the earlier wars here because in, it's a, a thing that, that one notices in Asia. Uh, people don't talk to their children about the, the hard and life that they've had before. They try to put a, a brave face on things and the young people don't really know how bad it has been here. Uh, maybe one day they, they will find out, but uh, we hope that they don't. I think that's slightly improved, though, with the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, as flawed as it is. But I find it r a relief to see that at least this has happened. Um, I, I, I don't think that um, justice could ever be found for what happened here. Two million people dead under Pol Pot and, and you know, decades of war. What are your views on the tribunal? It has been quite controversial over the years. Yes, but I, I think it was well worth having. Uh, only three uh, people have been uh, put away in, uh, in, in to, into prison. Uh, but the, it was very important that they did have these sentences and are forgotten by the, the young generation here now, but the old generation know that they've been put away and they, they feel satisfied and, and a bit safer about it, even though this is still a very difficult country with a with a head of state who has been in power for thir 32 years now. Indeed, and then there are elections coming up. We're heading back into the uh, Cambodian election cycle, commune elections in June and general elections in uh, July next year. Um, the ruling CPP, Cambodian People's Party, were, re were returned with a sharply reduced majority in 2013 as the younger demographics are coming to the fore and making their presence felt politically. How do you think Hun Sen will, uh, the Prime Minister, how do you think he will fare at the next election? I think that he and his uh, cronies around him will do their best to make sure that they, they, they get back into power again, uh, no matter how they do it. Uh, they control all the guns, and you know, Jim and Mao said political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And it, it, Hun Sen has controls all the guns here. Uh, there are tens of thousands of young people who would stand up against the, the regime, which has been in power far too long now, 32 years, as I mentioned. Uh, but they can't do that because they, they have no arms, and... The, 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 this is the, the army really is to pr protect the army here is really to protect the the leadership here. It's the very same leadership that that took over 32 years ago, and they're determined by hook or by crook to to hold on to this power. How do you get peaceful change in Southeast Asia, and not just Southeast Asia? Your experiences in Cuba and the Middle East, and there's been some charming. Uh, absolutely charming communist leaders, but people do like change. They want change. They want they want to feel they're involved with the political process. How how do you how do you bring that about in some of these countries where it, it they that hasn't happened, or in fact it's uh, it's actually uh, degenerated over recent years, particularly in Southeast Asia. 
Well, yes, uh, in Southeast Asia, there is only one democratic uh, country of the, of the ten nations that make up uh, the Southeast Asian area. Uh, and that, that is Indonesia, surprisingly enough. It, it ha has elections and its, its president is, uh, uh, has been elected by the people. And bringing about change itself, do you think it's possible? Inevitably, it will come at some, some stage, uh, later rather than sooner, I should think. My view would be that it is changing, but it's, it's happening with education and with the younger children that are they're going to school, they're getting a much better education, they're wider read and far more politically aware and I also think more politically astute in the sense they don't necessarily have to challenge by force, but they are working within the systems and the bureaucracies to bring change around quietly. I don't know how successful that will be, but... Yeah, it, it may be somewhat successful, uh, and I think things will improve in here and in other countries nearby, uh, in, in, in Rangoon, for example, and in, in, in Hanoi, things will will get better, uh, even in Laos too, although people are still disappearing there and never to be seen again. They are indeed, in particularly the classic case of uh, Sombat Somporn, the uh, rural agriculturalist who went missing a few years ago, and not a word out of Laos. It seems to, it has a nasty reputation. And of course, Myanmar has gone through some extraordinary changes over the last few years with the elections and the arrival of Aung San Suu Kyi in power, but there's been, as we all know, there's been enormous problems there with the Rohingya Muslim population. How do you think Aung San Suu Kyi has fared, particularly when measured against the expectations that people had of her before the elections? Well, I, I've known Aung San Suu Kyi for quite many a long year, and uh, remember 1996, I had a full hour with her in her lakeside villa and it was a very good interview. The Times actually ran it twice, <laughs> which is an unusual thing to do. But I, I think that we should give Aung San Suu Kyi the benefit of the doubt. Many uh, journalists I, have, I respect have already given up on her. But I, I think that because the remo Muslim Rohingyas are looked at askance by the, the, proper, the population in, in Myanmar, it's difficult for Aung San Suu Kyi to, to intervene, but she knows she has to do it. And, and this, this thing about uh, Buddhists and not getting on with Muslims, it, 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 hap it happened in Sri Lanka too, and it, it's something that it, it'll be hard to, for Aung San Suu Kyi to do, but I think she might in the future make some gesture towards the Rohingyas and uh, it, she might be given some respect by her own, her own people and they might say well this is what we have to do because that's what she, she says we should do and, and she knows. What are some of the solutions that she might be able to deploy? I, mean, I guess the, the, the Rohingyas probably need some kind of a homeland. Uh, well they, they don't really need a homeland but they need it to be a, pla a place where they, they can live in peace. We don't want to see uh, um, more people coming over from Bangladesh into into Myanmar, but I, I think the, that these Rohingyas who are already there have been there for generations, and I think they should be respected as such and be given a decent life. And then on, on top of what you were just saying, there's also Thailand, which has emerged of something as a democratic disappointment, I guess, and Malaysia, the scandal plague government of Najib Razak, uh, the, the, the news never gets any better. Yes, uh, I, I feel sorry for the Thais because they're p people who can well look after themselves, but uh, the military have been in power for the last two years again, and they lo don't, I don't think they're going to be out of power anytime soon. Th things are a bit better in Burma, but, uh, but in, in Malaysia, uh, for example, they're looking bad again. Indeed it is. I mean, Malaysia, you've got the one Malaysian development fund scandal and the missing $11 billion. Uh, that includes debt. You've got religious brawling. M Muslims would like to see 
the use of the word Allah banned. Uh, there's just no shortage of uh, social disruption. Do you think Najib Razak can hang on to power? Well, he's, he, he, he has the financial backing to do it. Uh, he has, uh, the Chinese are trying to throw their weight around all, all over Southeast Asia now and succeeding. Do you think that the Chinese influence, it, it really began, I think, about 15 years ago with their go-forward policy through business. Uh, do you think, you, you spent a lot of time in China, you were there with... Uh, the Times, you knew Deng Xiaoping. What we're seeing now, is that likely to change or is it, or is it just a slow moving train and it will just keep going and that uh, it will continue to spread its hegemony around the region, it will continue to go after the South China Sea, it will continue to try and influence governments by hook or by crook. Is there any chance that this sort of attitude, belligerent attitude, will lighten up? I don't see any sign of it yet. I. I think that the Chinese are behaving in a very belligerent manner and it could make things very difficult for Taiwan just down the road. It's disappointing because uh, you would think that the Chinese had learned much more in, in the past years and uh, would, would have a more reasonable outlook on, on life in Southeast Asia, but it doesn't seem like it so far. Which kind of brings us up to the present day and relations around the region. And, of course, we're living in the world of Donald Trump now and his attitudes to North Korea and the recent threat to uh, fix the problem with or without China makes one wonder, well, how can he do that? I don't think it's possible without military intervention. What are Donald Trump's chances of finding some kind of re resolution and some kind of perhaps um, livable arrangement with the Chinese? With the Chinese it's possible, but with the, the North Koreans I'm not sure that it is. They seem ready to hit back at whatever Donald Trump might put in their way. If he intervenes militarily in, in North Korea, it, it could end in tears. And of course the other group of people uh, in the equation are the South Koreans. And one has to wonder... What are they making of Donald Trump? After all, it's their lives that are going to be put on the block if it does turn into a nasty military brawl. Yeah, the, the South Koreans are really not uh, ready f to face this kind of warfare. But, you know, their capital city is so close to the, the border with North Korea that they could be smashed in, in a, a, a trice and uh, they wouldn't know what hit them. In, 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 a, in a protracted war, they, they, they might, the North Koreans might uh, find it difficult to continue in, in, in that way. But in the short term, it would be disastrous, I think. And of course, and amid all the politicking, of course, is the Japanese, who are never far from the surface when it comes to regional politics. And now that North Korea can fire a ballistic missile, certainly into Japanese, if it can fire it straight and hit Japan, it can do it. Uh, and the chances are that they can load a nuclear warhead into a ballistic missile. Is, uh, they're saying that North Korea can do that within the next two years, which would seem to indicate that the powers that be, uh, they're not going to tolerate that. And there does seem to be a, a gathering of forces, I guess. Yes, I think the, the Japanese will be forced to do what they never want, wanted to do since the, the end of the Second World War. And... Uh, I, I, I think we can expect the, the, the Japanese to stand up for themselves and they'll face down the, the, Ch the Chinese. Uh, they, they'll have the military might to, to do it, I think. And th th this is another very worrying trait that we're seeing. A lot of commentators are saying that, you know, no country can really stand up to the might of China, which is not quite true, particularly if you look at the combined efforts of the Japanese, Taiwanese, Americans, Australians who are up there as well. The Vietnamese, the Filipinos, well, with President Duterte there, it's difficult to know what his foreign policy is. Some commentators have also been saying that what could happen in the South China Sea, and you've got North Korea there as well, would be far worse than anything that's ever happened in the Middle East. Would you agree with that? You're one of the few people that I know who's spent extensive periods of time in both regions of the world. I think uh, there's, there's a danger of explosions in both parts of the world, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. This is why it's a very disappointing 
trait that we're seeing in the world. Uh, it, we should be more sensible. We've done we've done all these wars and so on, but it seems that we haven't learned anything from them, and we're going to be seeing more of this in the not too d distant future. And maybe the, the Japanese will be brought into it too. And we'll, we we know this will be terrible if they, if they face up to the the Chinese, but they've got to do it at some stage. And finally, Jim, I, I have to ask this question. If you were a young foreign correspondent and you were going to do it all again, and we both know the um, journalism business isn't what it used to be, but what would you do? Where would you go? What would you cover? Your 80th birthday, I understand, is coming up. If you were 25 again, where would you go? I think I'd do pretty much what I went did before. I was very interested in South America. I'd I spoke Spanish and uh, I went there and I ended up in Cuba and had many adventures there. I, so I still think I'd head in that direction. But also because I know the, the Far East now, I would, I, I would want to, to, to be, come back to Cambodia, to Vietnam and, and China itself. And on that most appropriate note, Jim Pringle, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim.